much. Um, I'm here today, in my opinion, to give you the most important J6 news since J6. I will be talking fast, so I think you have to listen fast. <laughs> the SCOTUS, as we heard a little bit from Jeff Clark a little bit ago, the S Supreme Court will be hearing a J6 case called USA versus Fisher in eight to 10 weeks. They will give a ruling in June, and that will either bring down this entire house of cards or will bring down the pretense that we have a rule of law in our nation. When SCOTUS accepted cert on Fisher case, several DC district court judges started whining that this increased their workload. Never mind that their own mediocrity and lack of judicial temperament caused such biased rulings that the Supreme Court has to step in. Accepting the Fisher case also paused Jack Smith's DC witch hunt. The Fisher appeal poses two legal questions that implicate thousands of laws in this nation. One is to define the word corruptly, and the other is whether a subset of a statute can be orphaned from its parent. You know me as a doctor, but many of you may not recall that I'm also an attorney, which is what I'm speaking on today. Let us first explain the specific felony statute. 18 U.S.C. 1512 C2 is part of the Corporate Fraud Accountability Act of 2002, and its title is Tampering with a Witness, Victim, or an Informant. Witness tampering ranges from minor to severe, from murder to violence to threats. Congress enacted the subsection C2 to capture the bad corporate actors who shred documents, specifically in response to the Enron accounting scandal of 2000 or 2000 and so. In fact, 1512 C2 is universally known as the Arthur Anderson loophole. When passing this law, the legislative and executive branches expressly stated that the intent of C2 subsection is to indict corporate bad actors. Congress said this is in response to Enron, and President Bush said the executive branch shall define corruptly as requiring proof of a criminal state of mind. I'm going to come back to that. For two decades and thousands of cases, the government has never used this statute against ordinary citizens, not once prior to January 6th, and not once after January 6th. None of the thousands of Kavanaugh protesters were charged with this. None of the protesters at Trump's inauguration were charged with this. Remember Democrat Congressman Jamal Bowman who pulled a fire alarm a few months ago right before a congressional vote? He was not charged with obstructing a, 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 a congressional proceeding. Just the J6ers, only those people were charged with the Arthur Anderson loophole. So the first legal question for the Supreme Court is, the government must show proof that a defendant acted corruptly. Virtually none of these cases did the government do that. The DC district judges and most of the appellate judges seem confused about what acting corruptly means, even though we all know that acting corruptly is defined as acting with an intent to procure a benefit for yourself or someone close to you. In addition, the president who signed this law, President Bush, specifically stated it must have a criminal state of mind. But our judges seem very confused on this. Law School 101 teaches that to break a law, you have to do two things. You have to do the act of breaking the law, and you have to have the mindset to break the law. It's called an actus rea and a mens rea. They're different. In J6 cases, the government simply evaporated the mens rea, the intent to break the law. The government's position is that each defendant had a corrupt intent because him, him being present meant it was a corrupt intent. This circular reasoning completely evaporates the concept of mens rea completely. It makes everyone susceptible to felony charges all the time. There's a book written about 10 years ago called Three Felonies a Day, and it describes how prosecutors can now charge almost anybody because the charges, the federal statutes are so disconnected from English common law. There are now tens of thousands of federal statutes which prosecutors can select that are a vague or technical prohibition and charge really any person with a felony. And that is exactly what happened on J6. Prosecutors picked an unrelated 20-year felony because it carried such a potentially lengthy prison sentence, and then they selectively charged the people it wanted to charge. Right? So, Congress said at the time it passed this 1512C2, it is to crack down on the corporate criminals and rebuild America's confidence in our markets. President Bush said, we should never use this statute to charge civilian protesters. But that's exactly what happened. Now, it did not matter that the charge contradicted the explicitly stated words of Congress or the explicitly stated words of the president who signed it into law. 
It did not matter that the charge violated the way the statute had been used thousands of times over two decades. And it did not matter that the plain English language of the statute does not support the charge. Once a weaponized DOJ decided to use it this way, all the US prosecutors fell into line, all the judges rolled over, hundreds of ordinary Americans with no intent to commit any crime endured frightening and violent SWAT team arrests, including me. Thousands were thrown into prison or threatened with prison, and another 100,000 more or so are anxious about it. Virtually all of the DC judges and many of the DC appellate judges agreed that the act of being present proved an intent to be corrupt. Yelling foul at this legal fiction with several dozen criminal defense attorneys, hundreds of J6 defendants, and journalist Julie Kelly. Finally, the most brilliant jurist on the DC appellate court, Judge Katsis, clarified for his hysterical peers that having a corrupt intent is required by the plain reading of the statute and by precedent. If the government's reasoning was correct, it encompasses almost any behavior. If there is no corrupt intent, then any conduct that affects any official proceeding, for example, lobbying, could be deemed illegal. So that's the question before the Supreme Court. The issue of did these people walking through the ropes, walking peacefully, act corruptly? The second issue before the Supreme Court in the Fisher case is whether a subset of a statute can be orphaned from its parent. Chapter 73 of the Federal Criminal Code is the Obstruction of Justice Code. It's 15,000 words long, 30, more than 30 pages long. 1512C2 is one tiny subsection among hundreds of subsections in this one chapter. With a straight face, the government has been arguing that a subparagraph nestled inside a subsection found in the middle of 19 otherwise narrow prohibitions is actually a standalone, all-encompassing statute. This is absurd reasoning, and it's the best one-liner I ever read in a judicial opinion. Judge Katz has said, Congress does not hide elephants in mouse holes. Mouse holes. It's crazy. C2 cannot be divorced or orphaned from the 1512 above it. Chapter 73 lists escalating penalties depending upon the facts. Picketing and parading carry one year. Threatening force is five to 10 years. Shredding evidence was the 20 years. The government's interpretation collapsed all of this, making any form of obstruction of any fel felony of any official proceeding a 20-year felony. Under this reasoning, a congressman who falsely pulls a fire alarm five minutes before a House vote would have to be charged with a 20-year felony, you know, unless he's a Democrat. Now, if SCOTUS does not void the felony charge for Fisher, it will evaporate the concept of mens rea, or intent, eliminate the plain English language of the word corruptly, ignore what Congress and the, and the President said when they passed the law, and redefine infinite federal subsections to become all-encompassing standalone statutes. Its decision will be felt far beyond this one statute, this one day, and this one cohort. If SCOTUS sets arson to decades of precedent, centuries of common law, and the plain meaning of the English language, then we are no longer operating under the rule of law. We will find out this June. Stay tuned.